just because I've been doing some photography, taking photographs of products for our business, our business that we run from home, which is making, Phil, make, my husband makes cremation urns out of wood. And so I take photos of them and then we put them up on a website so that people can buy them. So I've been busy doing that, but I also use the frame that I usually have my green screen hanging on is um, used as a backdrop for hanging the uh, the smooth backdrop for take, taking photographs so I can isolate them. So how is everybody? Have you been having a great weekend or have you been having a really stink weekend? Um, for some of you it's still Sunday night, for others of us it is Monday afternoon. So whatever I've been having a busy day so since since the really busy part of it I've been watching some whodunits and then nearly forgot that it was Monday and I needed to read so here we are we are here ready to read and I have my iPad mini ready to go and I have what else have we got going on here I found the right place I think chapter XIV 20, uh, 14, chapter 14, of A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett, and I shall read. On this very afternoon while Sarah was out, a strange thing happened in the attic. Only Melchizedek saw it and heard it, and he was so much alarmed and mystified that he scuttled back to his hole and hid there. Did I read you the chapter title? It's called Chapter 14, What Melchizedek Heard and Saw. So we shall carry on. Only Melchizedek saw and heard it, and he was so much alarmed and mystified that he scuttled back into his hole and hid there, and really quaked and trembled as he peeped out furtively and with great caution to watch what was going on. The attic had been very still all the, da all the day after Sarah had left in the early morning. The stillness had only been broken by the pattering of the rain upon the slates and the skylight. Melchizedek had in fact found it rather dull, and when the rain ceased to patter and perfect silence reigned, he decided to come out and reconnoitre. Though experience taught him that Sarah would not return for some time. He had been rambling and sniffing about and had just found a totally unexpected and unexplained crumb left from his last meal when his attention was attracted by a sound on the roof. Ooh, that sounds a little bit... Mmm, what's going to happen? Hang on, I'm just opening the chat on my phone so I can see what's going on, if there is anything going on. I hope there's nothing too much going on. That wouldn't be such a good thing. Anyway, we shall carry on here. Something had been happening on the roof. I'm just opening up something else on my other side here. <sighs> Sound on the roof. He stopped to listen with a palpitating heart. That means his heart was going boom, 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 boom. In a rush. Whoop, nearly there. Nearly there. He stopped to listen with a palpitating heart. The sound suggested that something was moving on the roof. It was approaching the skylight. It reached the skylight. The skylight was being mysteriously opened. A dark face peered into the attic. Then another face appeared behind it. And both looked in with signs of caution and interest. Two men were outside on the roof and were making silent preparations to enter through the skylight itself. One was Ram Dass, and the other was a young man who was the Indian gentleman's secretary. But of course, Melchizedek did not know this. He only knew that the men were invading the silence and privacy of the attic. And as the one with the dark face let himself down through the aperture with such lightness and dexterity that he did not make the slightest sound, Melchizedek turned tail and fled precipitately back to his hole. That means he did it in a hurry, didn't let anything else stand in his way. He was frightened to death. He had ceased to be timid with Sarah and knew she would never throw anything but crumbs and would never make any sound other than the soft, low, coaxing whistling. But strange men were dangerous things to remain near. He lay close and flat near the entrance of his home, just managing to peep through the crack with a bright, 
alarmed eye. How much he understood of the talk he heard, I am not in the least able to say. But even if he had understood it all, he would probably have re remained greatly mystified. Ooh. The secretary, who was light and young, slipped through the skylight as noiselessly as Ram Dass had done, and he caught a last glimpse of Melchizedek's vanishing tail. Was that a rat? he asked Ram Dass. In a whisper, yes, a rat, Sahib, answered Ram Dass, who were also whispering, there are many in the walls. Ugh! exclaimed the young man. It's a wonder the child is not terrified of them. Ramdas made a gesture with his hands. He also smiled respectfully. He was in this place as the intimate exponent of Sarah, though she had only spoken to him once. The child is a little friend of all things, Sahib, he answered. She is not as other children. I see her when she does not see me. I slip across the slates and look at her many nights to see that she is safe. I watch her from my window when she does not know I am near. She stands on the table there and looks out at the sky as if it spoke to her. The sparrows come at her call. The rat she has fed and tamed in her loneliness. The poor slave of the house comes to her for comfort. There is a little child who comes to her in secret. There is one other, uh, older who worships her and would listen to her forever if she might. This I have seen when I have crept across the roof. By the mistress of the house, who is an evil woman, she is treated like a pariah. But she has the bearing of a child who is of the blood of kings. You seem to know a great deal about her, the secretary said. All her life each day, oh, excuse me, itchy nose. All her life each day, I know, answered Ram Dass. She's her going out, I know, and her coming in, her sadness and her joys, her coldness and her hunger. I know when she sits alone until midnight, learning from her books. I know when her secret friends steal to her, and she is happier, as children can be, even in the midst of poverty, because they come and she may laugh and talk with them in whispers. If she were ill, I should know, and I would come and serve her, if it might be done. You are sure no one comes near this place but your herself, and that she will not return and surprise us. She would be frightened if she found us here, and the Sahib Karasford's plan would be spoiled. Ram Dass noise, crossed noiselessly, noiselessly. Ram Dass crossed noiselessly to the door and stood close to it. Try saying that in a hurry. None mount here but herself, Sahib. He said, she has gone out with her basket and may be gone for hours. If I stand here, I can hear any step before it reaches the last flight of the stairs. The secretary took a, a pencil and a tablet from his breast pocket. That's a little wee writing pad, a tablet back then. Keep your ears open, he said, and he began to walk softly and slowly round the miserable little room, making rapid notes on his tablet as he looked at things. First he went to the narrow bed. He pressed his hand upon the mattress and uttered an exclamation. It's as hard as stone, he said. That will have to be altered some day when she is out. A special journey can be made to bring it across. It cannot be done tonight. He lifted the covering and examined the one thin pillow. Coverlet, dingy and worn, blanket thin, sheets patched and ragged, he said. What a bed for a child to sleep in, and in a house which calls itself respectable. There has not been a fire in that grate for many a day, glancing at the rusty fireplace. Never since I have seen it, said Ram Dass. The mistress of the house is not one who remembers that another than herself may be cold. The secretary was writing quickly on his tablet. He looked up from it as he tore off a leaf and slipped it into his breast pocket. It is a strange way of doing the thing, he said. Who planned it? Ram Dass made an apology, a modestly apologetic obeisance. That means he bowed down modestly. It is true that the first thought was mine, Sahib, he said, though it was naught but a fantasy. But a fancy. I am fond of this child. We are both lonely. It is her way to relate her visions to her secret friends. Being sad one night, I lay close to the open skylight and listened. The vision she related told what this miserable room might be if it had comforts in it. 
She seemed to see it as she talked, and she grew cheered and warmed as she spoke. Then she came to this fancy, and the next day, the sahib being ill and wretched, I told him of the thing to amuse him. It seemed then but a dream, but it pleased the sahib. To hear of the child's doings gave him entertainment. He became interested in her and asked questions. At last he began to please himself with the thought of making her visions real things. "'You think it can be done while she sleeps? Suppose she awakened,' suggested the secretary. And it was evident that whatsoever the plan referred to was, it had caught and pleased his fancy, as well as Sahib Karasford's. "'I can move as if my feet were of velvet,' Ramdas replied. "'And children sleep soundly, even the unhappy ones.' I could have entered this room at night many times and without causing her to turn on her pillow. If the other bearer passes to me the things through the window, I can do it all and she will not stir. When she awakens, she will think a magician has been here. He smiled as if his heart, was, as, as if his heart warmed under his white robe and the secretary smiled back at him. It will, be a like, it will be like a story from the Arabian Nights, he said. Only an Oriental could have planned it. It does not belong to Lon London fogs. They did not remain very long, to the great relief of Melchizedek, who, as he probably did not comprehend their conversation, felt their movements and whispers ominous. The young secretary seemed interested in everything. He wrote down things about the floor, the fireplace, the broken footstool, the old table, the walls, which last he touched with his hand again and again, seeming, seeming much pleased when he found that a number of old nails had been driven in various places. You can hang things on them, he said. Ram Dass smiled mysteriously. Yesterday, when she was out, he said, I entered bringing with me small, sharp nails which can be pressed into the wall without blows from a hammer. I placed many in the plaster where I may need them. They are ready. Ooh. The Indian gentleman's secretary stood still and looked round him as he thrust his tablets back into his pocket. I think I have made notes enough. We can go now, he said. The Sahib Carisford has a warm heart. It is a thousand pities that he has not found the lost child. If he should find her, his strength would be restored to him, said Ram Dass. His God may lead her to him yet. Then they slipped through the skylight as noiselessly as they had entered it. And after he was quite sure they had gone, Melchizedek was greatly relieved and in the course of a few minutes felt it safe to him emerge from his hole again and scuffle about in the hope that even such alarming human beings as these might have chanced to carry crumbs in their pockets and drop one or two of them. Always hopeful isn't he? And that's the end of chapter 14 and we shall have chapter 15 in a minute. I shall have my drink of water and have you got yours ready? Here we go. treat for me. I hope you have a treat for you. I have here a piece of, oh you can't see that with the light. Let's see if I can move it somewhere better. There you go. Whitaker's, which is a New Zealand brand. West Coast Buttermilk Caramelized White Chocolate with gin Gingerbread Biscuit. And I'm going to have a piece. A very nice treat. I won't have very much because it's quite sweet and it's not good to have something too much sweet. Mm -hmm. It looks a bit grey in the way that my camera works at the moment. And we're nearly ready to read the next little bit. Mm. I hope my nose doesn't get itchy again. Right, here we go. Chapter 15. The Magic. 
Ooh, hang on a minute. We had magic in Secret Garden. But this is not the same people, so let's see what they have to say about it. Chapter 15 of A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. And this one's called The Magic. When Sarah had passed the house next door, she had seen Ram Dass closing the shutters and, and caught her glimpse of this room also. It is a long time since I saw a nice place from the inside. Side. From the inside was the thought which crossed her mind. There was the usual bright fire glowing in the grate, and the Indian gentleman was sitting before it. His head was resting in his hand, and he looked as lonely and unhappy as ever. Poor man, said Sarah, I wonder what you are supposing. And this is what he was supposing at that very moment. Suppose, he was thinking, suppose even if Carmichael traces the people to Moscow, <coughs> traces the people to Moscow, the little girl they took from Madame Pascal's, Pascal's school in Paris is not the one we are in search of. Suppose she proves to be quite a different child. What steps shall I take next? Because he's still looking for the daughter of his friend, remember? When Sarah went into the house, she met Miss Minchin, who had come downstairs to scold the cook. Where have you wasted your time? she demanded. You have been out for hours. It was so wet and muddy, Sarah answered. It was hard to walk because my shoes were so bad and slipped about. Make no excuses, said Miss Minchin, and tell no falsehoods. Sarah went in to the cook. The cook had received a lecture a severe lecture, and was in a fearful temper as a result. She was only too rejoiced to have someone to vent her rage on, and Sarah was a convenience, as usual. Why didn't you stay all night? she snapped. Sarah laid her purchases on the table. Here are the things, she said. The cook looked them over, grumbling. She was in a very savage humour indeed. May I have something to eat? Sarah asked, rather faintly. Tea's over and done with, was the answer. Did you expect me to keep it hot for you? Sarah stood silent for a second. I had no dinner, she said next, and her voice was quite low. She made it low because she was afraid it would tremble. tremble. There's some bread in the pantry, said the cook. That's all you'll get this time of day. Sarah went and found the bread. It was old and hard and dry. The cook was in too vicious a humour to give her anything to eat with it. It was always safe and easy to vent her spite on Sarah. Really, it was hard for the child to climb the three long flights of stairs leading to her attic. She often found them long and steep when she was tired, but tonight it seemed as if she would never reach the top. Several times she was obliged to stop to rest. When she reached the top landing, she was glad to see the glimmer of a light coming from under her door. That meant that Ermengarde had creeped up to pay her a visit. There was some comfort in that. It was better to go into the room than to go into the room alone and find it empty and desolate. The mere presence of plump, comfortable Ermengarde, wrapped in her red shawl, would warm it a little. Yes, there Ermengarde was when she opened the door. She was sitting in the middle of the bed with her feet tucked safely under her. She had never become intimate with Melchizedek and his family, though they rather fascinated her. When she found herself alone in the attic, she always preferred to sit on the bed until Sarah arrived. She had, in fact, on this occasion, had time to become rather nervous because Melchizedek had appeared and sniffed about a good deal and once had made her utter a repressed squeal by sitting up on his hind legs and, while he looked at her, sniffing pointedly in her direction. He's hoping for crumbs. Oh, Sarah, she cried out. I am glad you came. You have come. Melky would sniff about so. I tried to coax him to go back, but he wouldn't for such a long time. I like him, you know, but it does frighten me when he sniffs right at me. Do you think he ever would jump? No, answered Sarah. Ermengarde crawled forward on the bed to look at her. You do look tired, Sarah, she said. You are quite pale. I am tired, said Sarah dropping on to the lopsided footstool. Oh, there's Melchizedek, poor thing. He's come to ask for his supper. Melchizedek had come out of his hole as if he had been listening for her footstep. Sarah was quite sure he knew it. 
He came forward with an affectionate, expectant expression as Sarah put her hand in her pocket and turned it inside out, shaking her head. I'm very sorry, she said. I haven't one crumb left. Go home, Melchizedek, and tell your wife there was nothing in my pocket. I'm afraid I forgot because the cook and Miss Minchin were so cross. Melchizedek seemed to understand. He shuffled resignedly, if not contentedly, back to his home. <coughs> I did not expect to see you tonight, Ermy, Sarah had said. Ermengarde hugged herself in, her, in the red shawl. Miss Amelia has gone out to spend the night with her old aunt, she explained. No one else ever comes and looks into the bedrooms after we are in bed. I could stay here until tomorrow if I wanted to. She pointed towards the table under the skylight. Sarah had not looked towards it when she came in. A number of books were piled upon it. Ermengarde's gesture was a dejected one. Papa has sent me some more books, Sarah, she said. There they are. Sarah looked round and got up at once. She ran to the table and picked up the top volume, turned over its leaves quickly. For the moment she forgot her discomforts. Ah, she cried out, how beautiful. Carlyle's French Revolution. I have so wanted to read that. I haven't, said Ermengarde, and Papa will be so cross if I don't. He'll expect me to know all about it when I go home for the holidays. What shall I do? Sarah stopped turning over the leaves and looked at her with an excited flush on her cheeks. Look here, she cried. If you'll lend me these books, I'll read them and tell you everything that's in them afterward, and I'll tell it so that you will remember it too. Oh, goodness, exclaimed Ermengarde. Do you think you can? I know I can, said Sarah. The little ones always remember what I tell them. Sarah, said Ermengarde, hope, hope gleaming in her round face, if you'll do that and make me remember, I'll, I'll give you anything. I don't want you to give me anything, said Sarah. I want your books. I want them. And her eyes grew big and her chest heaved. Big breaths. Take them then, said Ermengarde. I wish I wanted them, but I don't. I'm not clever and my father is and he thinks I ought to be. Sarah was opening one book after the other. What are you going to tell your father, she asked, a slight doubt dawning in her mind. Oh, he needn't know, answered Ermengarde. He'll think I've read them. Sarah put down her book and shook her head slowly. That's almost like telling lies, she said, and lies, well, you see, they are not only wicked, they're vulgar. That means rough and coarse. Sometimes, reflectively, she spoke on. I've thought perhaps I might do something wicked. I might suddenly fly into a rage and kill Miss Minchin, you know, when she was ill-treating me, but I couldn't be vulgar. Why can't you tell your father I read them? He wants me to read them, said Ermengarde, a little discouraged by this unexpected turn of affairs. He wants you to know what is in them, said Sarah, and if I can tell it to you in an easy way and make you remember it, I think he would like that. He'll like it if I learn anything in any way, said Rufal Ermengarde. You would if you were my father. It's not your fault that, began Sarah. She pulled herself up and stopped rather suddenly. She had been going to say, it's not your fault that you are stupid. What's that? Ermengarde asked. That you can't learn things quickly, amended Sarah. If you can't, you can't. If I can, why I can, that's all. She always felt very tender of Ermengarde and tried not to let her feel too strongly the difference between being able to learn anything at once and not being able to learn anything at all. As she looked at her plump face, one of her wise old-fashioned thoughts came to her. Perhaps, she said, to be able to learn things quickly isn't everything. <clears throat> to be kind is worth a great deal to other people. If Miss Minchin knew everything on earth and was like what she is now, she'd still be a detestable thing and everybody would hate her. Lots of clever people have done harm and been wicked. Look at Robespierre. That's the chap who was quite key in the French Revolution and had lots of people killed. She stopped and examined Ermengarde's countenance, which was beginning to look bewildered. Don't you remember, she demanded. I told you about him not long ago. I believe you've forgotten. Well, I don't remember all of it, admitted Ermengarde. Well, you wait a minute, said Sarah, and I'll take off my wet things and wrap myself in the, in the coverlet and tell you over again. She took off her hat and coat 
and hung them on a nail against the wall, and she changed her wet shoes for an old pair of slippers. Then she jumped on the bed, and drawing the coverlet around her shoulders, sat with her arms round her knees. Now listen, she said. She plunged into the gory records of the French Revolution, and told such stories of it that Ermengarde's eyes grew round with alarm, and she held her breath. But though she was rather terrified, there was a delightful thrill in listening. And she was not likely to forget Robespierre again, or to have any doubts about the Princesse de Lamballe. You know they put her head on a pike and danced around it, Sarah explained, and she had beautiful floating blonde hair, and when I think of her I never see her head on her body, but always on a pike, with those furious people dancing and howling. A pike is like a long spear with a, a bit on the top. It was agreed that Mr. St. John would be, or St. John, was to be told the plan they had made, and for the present the books were to be left in the attic. Now let's tell each other things, said Sarah. How are you getting on with your French lessons? Ever so much better since the last time I came up here and you explained the conjugations. Miss Minchin could not understand why I did my exercises so well that first morning. Sarah laughed a little and hugged her knees. She doesn't understand why Lottie is doing her sums so well, she said, but it is because she creeps up here too, and I help her. She glanced round the room. The attic would be rather nice if it wasn't so dreadful, she said, laughing again. It's a good place to pretend in. The truth was that Ermengarde did not know anything about the sometimes almost unbearable side of life in the attic. She had not a sufficiently vivid imagination to depict it for herself. On the rare occasions that she could reach Sarah's room, she only saw that side of it which was made exciting by things which were pretended and stories which were told. Her visits partook of the character of adventures, and though sometimes Sarah looked rather pale, it was not to be denied that she had grown very thin. Her proud little spirit would not admit to complaints. She had never confessed that at times she was almost ravenous with hunger, as she was tonight. She was growing rapidly, and her constant walking and running about would have given her a keen appetite even if she'd had abundant and regular meals of a much more nourishing nature than the unappetizing, inferior food snatched at such odd times as suited the kitchen convenience. She was growing used to a certain gnawing feeling in her young stomach. I suppose soldiers feel like this when they're on a long and weary march, she often said to herself. She liked the sound of the phrase, long and weary march. It made her feel rather like a soldier. She also had a quaint sense of being a hostess in the attic. If I lived in a castle, she argued, and Ermengarde was the lady of another castle and came to see me with knights and squires and vassals riding with her and pennons flying, when I heard the clarions sounding outside the drawbridge, I should go down and receive her and I should help spread feasts in the banquet hall, and call in minstrels to play and sing and relate romances. When she comes into the attic, I can't spread feasts, but I can tell stories, and not let her know disagreeable things. I dare say poor Chatelaines had to do that in times of famine, when their lands had been pillaged. She was a proud, brave little Chatelaine, and dispensed generously the one hospitality she could offer, the dreams she dreamed, the visions she saw, the imaginings which were her joy and comfort. So they sat together. Ermengarde did not know that she was faint as well as ravenous, and that while she talked she now and then wondered if her hunger would let her sleep when she was left alone. She felt as if she had never been quite so hungry before. <coughs> Sorry, turning a page. I wish I was as thin as you, Sarah, Ermengarde said suddenly. I believe you're thinner than you used to be. Your eyes look so big. And look at the sharp little bones sticking out of your elbow. Sarah pulled down her sleeve, which had pushed itself up. I always was a thin child, she said bravely, and I always had big green eyes. I love your green eyes, eyes said Ermengarde, looking into them with affectionate admiration. They always look as if they saw such a long way. I love them, and I love them to be green, though they look black, generally. I think that's because it's usually night time and they're up in the attic, and so therefore her pupils are wider than normal, and then it makes her eyes look darker. 
They are cat's eyes, laughed Sarah, but I can't see in the dark with them because I have tried and I couldn't. I wish I could. It was just at this minute that something happened at the skylight, which neither of them saw. If either of them had chanced to turn and look, she would have been startled by the sight of a dark face which peered cautiously into the room, and disappeared as quickly and almost as silently as it had appeared. Not quite as silently, however. Sarah, who had keen ears, suddenly turned a little and looked up at the roof. That didn't sound like Melchizedek. She said it wasn't scratchy enough. What? said Ermengarde, a little startled. Didn't you hear something? asked Sarah. No, Ermengarde faltered. Did you? Perhaps I didn't, said Sarah, but I thought I did. It sounded as if something was on the slates, something that dragged softly. What could it be, said Ermengarde? Could it be robbers? No, began Sarah cheerfully. There's nothing to steal. She broke off in the middle of her words. They both heard the sound that checked her. It was not on the slates, but on the stairs below, and it was Miss Minchin's angry voice. Sarah sprang off the bed and put out the candle. She is scolding Becky, she whispered as she stood in the darkness. She is making her cry. Will she come in here? Ermengarde whispered back, panic-stricken. No, she will think I am in bed. Don't stir. It was very seldom that Miss Minchin mounted the last flight of stairs. Sarah could only remember that she had done it once before, but now she was angry enough to be coming at least part of the way up, and it sounded as if she was driving Becky before her. You impudent, dishonest child, she heard her say. Cook tells me she has missed things repeatedly. Twarn't me, Mum, said Becky, sobbing. I was I was hungry enough, but twarn't me, never. You deserve to be sent to prison, said Miss Minchin's voice. Picking and stealing, half a meat pie indeed. Twarn't me, wept Becky. I could have eaten a whole un, but I never laid a finger on it. Miss Minchin was out of breath between temper and mounting the stairs. The meat pie had been intended for her late his, her special late supper. No wonder she was angry. It became apparent that she boxed Becky's ears. Don't tell falsehoods, she said. Go to your room this instant. Both Sarah and Ermengarde heard the slap and then heard Becky run in her slipshod shoes up the stairs and into her attic. They heard her door shut and knew that she threw herself upon her bed. I could have eaten two of them, they heard her cry into her pillow, and I never took a bite. Twas Cook gave it to her policeman. So Becky knew what had happened, but didn't say. Sarah stood in the middle of the room in the darkness. She was clenching her little teeth and opening and shutting fiercely her outstretched hands. She could scarcely stand still, but she dared not move until Miss Minchin had gone down the stairs and all was still. The wicked, cruel thing, she burst forth. The cook takes things for herself and then says Becky steals them. She doesn't. She doesn't. She's so hungry sometimes that she eats crusts out of the ash barrel. She pressed her hands hard against her face and burst into passionate little sobs, and Ermengarde, hearing this unusual thing, was overawed by it. Sarah was crying. The unconquerable Sarah. It seemed to denote something new, some mood she had never known. Suppose, suppose, a new dread possibility presented itself to her kind slow little mind all at once. She crept off the bed in the dark and found her way to the table where the candle stood. She struck a match and lit the candle. When she had lighted it she bent forward and looked at Sarah with her new thought growing to definite fear in her eyes. Sarah, she said in a timid, almost awe-stricken voice, are, are, you never told me. I don't want to be rude, but are you ever hungry? It was too much just at that moment. The barrier broke down. Sarah lifted her face from her hands. Yes, she said in a new passionate way. Yes, I am. I'm so hungry now that I could almost eat you, and it makes it worse to hear poor Becky. She's hungrier than I am. Ermengarde gasped. Oh, Oh, she cried woefully, and I never knew. I didn't want you to know, said Sarah. It would have made me feel like a street beggar. I know I look like a street beggar. 
No, you don't. You don't, Ermengarde broke in. Your clothes are a little queer, but you couldn't look like a street beggar. You haven't got a street beggar face. A little boy once gave me a sixpence for charity, said Sarah, with a short little laugh, in spite of herself. Here it is, and she pulled out the thin ribbon from her neck. He wouldn't have given me his Christmas sixpence if I hadn't looked as if I needed it. Somehow the sight of the dear little sixpence was good for both of them. It made them laugh a little, though they both had tears in their eyes. Who was he? asked Ermengarde, looking at, at it quite as if it had not been a mere ordinary silver sixpence. He was a darling little thing going to a party, said Sarah. He was one of the large family, the little one with the round legs, the one I call Guy Clarence. I suppose his nursery was crammed with Christmas presents and hampers full of cakes and things, and he could see I had had nothing. Ermengarde gave a little jump backward. The last sentences had recalled something to her troubled mind and given her a sudden inspiration. Oh, Sarah, she cried, what a silly thing I am not to have thought of it. Of what? Something splendid, said Ermengarde in an excited hurry. This very afternoon my nicest aunt sent me a box. It is full of good things. I never touched it. I had so much pudding at dinner and I was so bothered about Papa's books. Her words began to tumble over each other. It's got cake in it and little meat pies and jam tarts and buns and oranges and red currant wine and figs and chocolate. I'll creep back to my room and get it this minute and we'll eat it now. Sarah almost reeled. When one is faint with hunger, the mention of food has sometimes a curious effect. She clutched Ermengarde's arm. Do you think you could, she ejaculated. That means that the words came out in a hurry. I know I could, answered Ermengarde, and she ran to the door, opened it softly, put her head out into the darkness, and listened. Then she went back to Sarah. The lights are out. Everybody's in bed. I can creep and creep and no one will hear. It was so delightful that they caught each other's hands and a sudden light sprang into Sarah's eyes. Ermy, she said, let us pretend. Let us pretend it's a party. And, oh, won't you invite the prisoner in the next cell? Yes, yes, let us knock on the wall now. The jailer won't hear. Sarah went to the wall. Through it she could hear poor Becky crying more softly. She knocked four times. That means come to me through the secret passage under the wall, she explained. I have something to communicate. Five quick knocks answered her. She's coming, she said. Almost immediately the door of the attic opened and Becky appeared. Her eyes were red and her cap was sliding off, and when she caught sight of Ermengarde she began to rub her face nervously with her apron. Don't mind me a bit, Becky, cried Ermengarde. Miss Ermengarde has asked you to come in, said Sarah, because she is going to bring a, bro bring a box of good things up here to us. Becky's cap almost fell off entirely. She broke in with such excitement. To eat, miss, she said. Things that's good to eat. Yes, answered Sarah, and we're going to pretend a party. And you shall have as much to eat as you want to eat, put in Ermengarde. I'll go this minute. She was in such a haste that as she tiptoed out of, the, out of the attic, she dropped her red shawl and did not know it had fallen. No one saw it for a minute or so. Becky was too much overpowered by the good luck which had befallen her. Oh, miss, oh, miss, she gasped. I know it makes, it was you that asked her to let me come. It, it makes me cry to think of it. And she went to Sarah's side and looked at her worshippingly. But in Sarah's hungry eyes the old light had begun to glow and transform her world for her. Here in the attic with the cold night outside, with the afternoon with the sloppy streets barely passed, with the memory of the awful unfed look in the beggar child's eyes not yet faded, the simple cheerful thing had happened like a thing of magic. She caught her breath. Somehow, something Always happens, she cried, just before things get to the very worst. It is as if the magic did it. If I could only just remember that, always. The worst thing never quite comes. She gave Becky a little cheerful shake. No, no, you mustn't cry, she said. We must make haste and set the table. Set the table, miss, said Becky, gazing round the room. What'll we set it with? 
Sarah looked round the attic too. There doesn't seem to be much, she answered, half laughing. At that moment she saw something and pounced upon it. It was Ermengarde's red shawl, which lay upon the floor. Here's the shawl, she cried. I know she won't mind it. It will make such a nice red tablecloth. They pulled the old table forward and threw the shawl over it. Red is a wonderfully kind and comfortable colour. It can... It began to make the room look furnished directly, that means immediately. How nice a red rug, rug would look on the floor, exclaimed Sarah. We must pretend there is one. Her eyes swept the bare boards with a swift glance of admiration. The rug was laid down already. How soft and thick it is, she said with the little laugh which Becky meant, knew the meaning of, and she raised and set her foot down again delicately as if she felt something under it. "'Yes, miss,' answered Becky, watching her with serious rapture. She was always quite serious. "'What next now?' said Sarah, and she looked still. She stood still and put her hands over her eyes. "'Something will come if I think, and wait a little,' in a soft, expectant voice. "'The magic will tell me.' One of her favourite fancies was that, on the outside, as she called it, thoughts were waiting for people to call on them. Becky had seen her stand and wait many a time before, and knew that in a few seconds she would un uncover an enlightened, laughing face. In a moment she did. There, she cried, it has come. I know now. I must look among the things in the old trunk I had when I was a princess. <coughs> she flew to its corner and kneeled down. It had not been put in the attic for her benefit, but because there was no room for it anywhere else. Nothing had been left in it but rubbish, but she knew she could find something. The magic always arranged that kind of thing in one way or another. In a corner lay a package so insignificant looking that it had been overlooked, and when she herself had found it, she had kept it as a relic. It contained a dozen small white handkerchiefs. She seized them joyfully and ran to the table. She began to arrange them upon the red table cover, patting and coaxing them into shape, with the narrow lace edge curling outward, her magic working its spells for her as she did it. These are the plates, she said. They are golden plates. They are richly embroidered napkins. Nuns worked them in convents in Spain. Did they, miss? breathed Becky, her very soul uplifted by the information. You must pretend it, said Sarah. If you pretend it enough, you will see them. Yes, miss, said Becky. And as Sarah returned to the trunk, she devoted herself to the effort of accomplishing an end so much to be desired. Sarah turned suddenly to find herself standing by the table, looking very queer indeed. She had shut her eyes and was twisting her face in strange, convulsive contortions. Her, fa her hands hanging stiffly clenched at her sides, she looked as if she was trying to lift some enormous weight. "'What is the matter, Becky?' Sarah cried. What are you doing? Becky opened her eyes with a start. I was a pretending, miss, she answered a little sheepishly. I was trying to see it like you do. I almost did, with a hopeful grin, but it takes a lot of strength. Perhaps it does if you're not used to it, said Sarah with a friendly sympathy. But you don't know how easy it is when you've done it often. I wouldn't try so hard just at first. It will come to you after a while. I'll just tell you what things are. Look at these. She held an old summer hat in her hand, which she had fished out of the bottom of the trunk. There was a wreath of flowers on it. She pulled the wreath off. These are garlands for the feast, she said grandly. They fill all the air with perfume. There is a mug on the washstand, Becky. Oh, and bring the soap dish for a centrepiece. Becky handed them to her reverently. What are they now, miss? she inquired. You'd think they was made of crockery, but I know they ain't. This is a carven flagon, said Sarah, arranging tendrils of the wreath about the mug. That means carved, out of, like out of wood or something. And this, bending tenderly over the soap dish and heaping it with roses, is purest alabaster encrusted with gems. She touched the things gently, a happy smile hovering about her lips, which made her look as if she was a creature in a dream. My, ain't it lovely? whispered Becky. If we just had something for bonbon dishes, Sarah murmured. There, darting to the trunk again. I remember I saw something this minute. 
It was only a bundle of wool wrapped in red and white tissue paper, but the tissue paper was soon twisted into the form of little dishes and was combined with the remaining flowers to ornament the candlestick, which was, which was to light the feast. Only the magic could have made it more than an old table, covered with a red shawl and set with rubbish from a long unopened trunk. But Sarah drew back and gazed at it, seeing wonders, and Becky, after staring in delight, spoke with bated breath. This ear, she suggested with a glance round the attic, is it the Bastille now, or has it turned into something different? Oh, yes, yes, said Sarah, quite different. It is a banquet hall. My eye, miss, ejaculated Becky, a blanket hall, and she turned to view the splendours about her with awed bewilderment. A banquet hall, said Sarah. A vast chamber where feasts are given. It has a vaulted roof and a minstrel's gallery and a huge chimney filled with blazing oaken logs and it is brilliant with waxen tapers twinkling on every side. Waxen tapers are candles, special ones. My eye, Miss Sarah, gasped Becky again. Then the door opened and Ermengarde came in, rather staggering under the weight of her hamper. She started back with an exclamation of joy to enter from the chill darkness outside and find oneself confronted by a totally unanticipated festial board draped with red, adorned with white napery and wreathed with flowers was to feel that the preparations were brilliant indeed. Oh, Sarah, she cried out, you are the cleverest girl I saw. Isn't it nice, said Sarah, there are things out of, these are, they are things out of my old trunk. I asked my magic and it told me to go and look. But, oh, miss, wait till she's told you what they are. They ain't just, oh, miss, please tell her, appealing to Sarah. So Sarah told her and because her magic helped her, she made her almost see it all. The golden platters, the vaulted spaces, the blazing logs, the twinkling waxen tapers. As the things were taken out of the hamper, the frosted cakes, the fruits, the bonbons and the wine, the feast became a splendid thing. It's like a real party, said Ermengarde. It's like the Queen's table, said Becky. Then Ermengarde had a sudden brilliant thought. I'll tell you what, Sarah, she said. Pretend you are a princess now and this is a royal feast. But it's your feast, said Sarah. You must be the princess and we will be your maids of honour. Oh, I can't, said Ermengarde. I'm too fat and I don't know how. You be her. Well, if you want me to, said Sarah. But suddenly she thought of something else and ran to the rusty grate. There's a lot of paper and rubbish stuffed in here, she exclaimed. If we light it, there will be a bright blaze for a few minutes and we shall feel it, feel as if it was a real fire. She struck a match and lighted it up with a great glow which illuminated the room. By the time it stops blazing, Sarah said, we shall forget about its not being real. She stood in the dance and glow and smiled. Doesn't it look real, she said. Now we will begin the party. She led the way to the table. She waved her hand graciously to Ermengarde and Becky. She was in the midst of her dream. Advance, fair damsels, she said in her happy dream voice, and be seated at the banquet table. My noble father, the king, who is absent on a long journey, has commanded me to feast you. She turned her head slightly toward the corner of the room. What ho there, minstrel, strike up with your viols and bassoons. Princesses, she explained rapidly to Ermengarde and Becky, always had minstrels to play at their feasts. Pretend there is a minstrel gallery up there in the corner. Now we will begin. They had barely had time to take their pieces of cake into their hands. Not one of them had time to do more when they all three sprang to their feet and turned pale faces toward the door, listening, listening. Someone was coming up the stairs. There was no mistake about it. Each of them recognised the angry mounting tread and knew that the end of things had come. It's, it's the missus, choked Becky and dropped her piece of cake upon the floor. Yes, said Sarah, her eyes growing shocked and large in her small white face. Miss Minchin has found us out. Miss Minchin struck the door open with a blow of her hand. She was pale herself, but it was with rage. She looked from the frightened faces to the banquet table and from the banquet table to the last flicker of burnt paper in the grate. I have been suspecting something of this sort, she exclaimed, but I did not dream of such audacity. Lavinia was telling the truth. So they knew it was Lavinia who had somehow guessed their secret and had betrayed them. 
Miss Minchin strode over to Becky and boxed her ears for a second time. You impudent creature, she said. You leave this, the house in the morning. Sarah stood quite still, her eyes growing larger, her face paler. Ermengarde burst into tears. Oh, don't send her away, she sobbed. My aunt sent me the hamper. We're only having a party. So I see, said Miss Minchin witheringly. With the Princess Sarah at the head of the table. She turned fiercely on Sarah. It is your doing, I know, she cried. Ermengarde would never have thought of such a thing. You decorated the table, I suppose, with this rubbish. She stamped her foot at Becky. Go to your attic, she commanded. And Becky stole away, her face hidden in her apron, her shoulders shaking. Then it was Sarah's turn. I will attend to you tomorrow. You shall have neither breakfast, dinner, nor supper. I've not had either dinner or supper today, Miss Minchin, said Sarah rather faintly. Then all the better, you will have something to remember. Don't stand there, put those things into the hamper again. She began to sweep them off the table, into the hamper herself, and caught sight of Ermengarde's new books. And you, to Ermengarde, have brought your beautiful new books into this dirty attic. Take them and go up, go back to bed. You will stay there all day tomorrow and I shall write to your papa. What would he say if he knew where you are tonight? Something she saw in Sarah's grave fit fixed gaze at this moment made her turn on her fiercely what are you thinking of she demanded why do you look at me like that i was wondering answered sarah as she had answered that notable day in the schoolroom what were you wondering it was very like the scene in the schoolroom there was no pertness in sarah's manner it was only sad and quiet i was wondering she said in a low voice what my papa would say if he knew where i am tonight Miss Minchin was infuriated just as she had been before and her anger expressed itself as before in an intemperate fashion. She flew at her and shook her. You insolent, unmanageable child, she cried. How dare you? How dare you? She picked up the books, swept the rest of the feast back into the hamper in a jumbled heap, thrust it into Ermengarde's arms and pushed her before, the, before her toward the door. I will leave you to wonder, she said. Go to bed this instant and she shut the door behind herself and poor stumbling Ermengarde and left Sarah standing quite alone. The dream was quite at an end. The last spark had died out of the paper in the grate and left only black tinder. The table was left bare. The golden plates and richly embroidered napkins and the garlands were transformed again into old handkerchiefs, scraps of red and white paper, and discarded artificial flowers all scattered on the floor. The minstrels in the minstrel gallery had stolen away, and the viols and bassoons were still. Emily was sitting with her back against the wall, staring very hard. Sarah saw her and went and picked her up with trembling hands. There isn't any banquet left, Emily, she said, and there isn't any princess. There is nothing left but the prisoners in the Bastille. And she sat down and hid her face. What would have happened if she had not hidden it just then, and if she had chanced to look up at the skylight at the wrong moment, I do not know. Perhaps the end of this chapter might have been quite different, because if she had glanced at the skylight, she would certainly have been startled by what she would have seen. She would have seen exactly the same face pressed against the glass and peering in at her as it had peered in earlier in the evening when she had been talking to Ermengarde. But she did not look up. She sat with her little black head in her arms for some time. She always sat like that when she was trying to bear something in silence. Then she got up and went slowly to the bed. I can't pretend anything else while I am awake, she said. There wouldn't be any use in trying. If I go to sleep, perhaps a dream will come and pretend for me. She suddenly felt so tired, perhaps through want of food, that she sat down on the edge of the bed quite weakly. Suppose there were a bright fire in the grate with lots of little dancing flames, she murmured. Suppose there was a comfortable chair before it. And suppose there was a small table near, with a little hot, hot supper on it. And suppose, as she drew the thin coverings over her, suppose this was a beautiful, soft bed, with fleecy blankets and large, downy pillows. 
Suppose, suppose, and her very weariness was good for her, to her, for her eyes closed and she fell fast asleep. She did not know how long she had slept, but she had been tired enough to sleep deeply and profoundly, too deeply and soundly to be disturbed by anything, even by the squeaks and scamperings of Melchizedek's entire family, if all his sons and daughters had chosen to come out of their hole to fight and tumble and play. If. When she awakened, it was rather suddenly, and she did not know that anything particular had called her out of her sleep. The truth was, however, that it was a sound which had called her back, a real sound, the click of the skylight as it fell in closing after a lithe white figure which slipped through it and crouched down close by upon the slates of the roof, just near enough to see what happened in the attic, but not near enough to be seen. At first she did not open her eyes. She felt too sleepy and, curiously enough, too warm and comfortable. She was so warm and comfortable indeed that she did not believe she was really awake. She never was as warm and cosy as this, except in some lovely vision. What a nice dream, she murmured. I feel quite warm. I don't want to wake up. Of course it was a dream. She felt as if warm, delightful bedclothes were heaped upon her. She could actually feel blankets, and when she put out her hand, it touched something exactly like a satin-covered eider-down quilt. She must not awaken from this delight. She must be quite still and make it last. But she could not. Even though she kept her eyes closed tightly, she could not. Something was forcing her to awaken. Something in the room. Excuse me. It was a sense of light and sound, the sound of a crackling, roaring little fire. Oh, I am awakening, she said mournfully. I can't help it. I can't. Her eyes opened in spite of herself, and then she actually smiled, for what she saw she had never seen in the attic before, and knew she never should see. Oh, I haven't awakened, she whispered, daring to rise on her elbow and look all about her. I am dreaming yet. She knew it must be a dream, for if she were awake, such things could not, could not be. Do you wonder that she felt sure she was not come back to earth? This is what she saw. In the grate, there was a glowing, blazing fire. On the hob was a little brass kettle, hissing and boiling. Spread upon the floor was a thick, warm, crimson rug. Before the fire, a folding chair, unfolded and with cushions on it. By the chair, a small folding table, unfolded, covered with white cloth. And upon it spread small covered dishes, a cup, a saucer, a teapot. On the bed were new warm coverings and a satin covered down quilt. At the foot, a curious wadded silk robe, a pair of quilted slippers and some boots, books, sorry, not boots, books and some books. The room of her dream seemed changed into fairyland, and it was flooded with warm light, for a bright lamp stood on the table covered with a rosy shade. She sat up, resting on her elbow, and her breathing came short and fast. It does not melt away, she panted. Oh, I never had such a dream before. She scarcely dared to stir, but at last she pushed the bedclothes aside and put her feet on the floor with a rapturous smile. I am dreaming, I am getting out of bed, she heard her own voice say, and then as she stood up in the midst of it all, turning slowly from side to side, I am dreaming it stays real, I am dreaming it feels real, it's bewitched, or I am bewitched, I only think I see it all. Her words began to hurry themselves, if I can only keep thinking it, she cried, I don't care, I don't care. She stood panting a moment longer and then cried out again. Oh, it isn't true, she said. It can't be true, but oh, how true it seems. The blazing fire drew her to it, and she knelt down and held out her hands close to it, so close that the heat made her start back. A fire I only dreamed wouldn't be hot, she cried. She sprang up touched the table, the dishes, the rug. She went to the bed and touched the blankets. She took up the soft, wadded dressing gown and suddenly clutched it to her breast and held it to her cheek. It's warm. It's soft. 
she almost sobbed. It's real, it must be. She threw it over her shoulders and put her feet into the slippers. They are real too, it's all real, she cried. I am not, I am not dreaming. She almost staggered to the books and opened the one which lay on the top. Something was written on the flyleaf. That's the ins inside the front cover on the front page. Just a few words, and they were these. To the little girl in the attic, from a friend. When she saw that, wasn't it a strange thing for her to do? She put her face down upon the page and burst into tears. I don't know who it is, she said, but somebody cares for me a little. I have a friend. She took her candle and stole out of her own room and into Becky's and stood by her bedside. Becky, Becky, she whispered as loudly as she dared. Wake up. When Becky wakened and she sat upright, staring aghast, her face still smudged with traces of tears, beside her stood a little figure in a luxurious wadded robe of crimson silk. The face she saw was a shining, wonderful thing. The Princess Sarah, as she remembered her, stood in her very, at her very bedside, holding a candle in her hand. Come, she said. Oh, Becky, come. Becky was too frightened to speak. She simply got up and followed her with her mouth and eyes open, and without a word. And when they crossed the threshold, Sarah, Sarah shut the door gently and drew her into the warm, glowing midst of things, which, ha which made her brain reel and her hungry senses faint. It's true, it's true, she cried. I've touched them all. They're as real as we are. The magic has come and done it. Becky, while we were asleep, the magic that won't let those worst things ever quite happen and that's the end of the chapter and the that is the end of today's reading we will save the next chapter which is chapter 16 called the visitor until next time that was a long one and so many things happened wow goodness me did you write down your new words have you looked them up have you have you looked up your, no, not today's ones. Have you looked up your ones from last time and the time before? Don't forget, next time I see you, I would love you to have your piece of paper and your pen or pencil handy so you can write down your new words. Yes, that is lovely. I really, really like this story. It's one of my favorites. So I hope it's one that you really enjoy too. And when we've finished the story, I'm hoping to read some other ones, not necessarily by the same author, but other ones from the same sort of time period just because there's something different about them. Anyway, so all the best for your next few days until we meet again, and I look forward to reading some more stories for you. Bye!